and welcome to a new episode of Publishing Insight, an interview podcast about working in publishing. I'm Flavia, your host, and in this episode I interview Anna Kenane, Systems and Data Manager at Abrams and Chronicle Books. Anna explains what metadata and onyx feeds are, how coding can help improve processes in the publishing industry, and why having a mentor is so important for junior professionals. For any comments or feedback, you can write me an email at publishinginsight@gmail.com or get in touch on Twitter and Instagram at flamflam91 flam91 using the hashtag publishinginsight. Publishing Insight is an independent project, so if you'd like to support it, you can donate on coffee, subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave a review. All the links mentioned are in the description box of the podcast and on my website www.publishing-insight.com. Happy listening! Hello and welcome to a new episode of Publishing Insight. Today my guest is Anna Kenane. Systems and Data Manager at Abrams and Chronicle Books. Hi, Anna. How are you? Hi, Flavia. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. No problem. It's a pleasure. Should I start with my first question? Yeah, go ahead. Can you tell us about your academic and career path so far? Yeah, sure. So um, I had a fairly typical route into publishing, I think. I did an English literature degree. Um, and then I did the publishing MA at UCL. Um, and then I sort of, I, I, I went to be an assistant to uh, the MD of an independent publishing company called Kyle Cathy. So uh, Kyle Cathy Publishers or Kyle Books at that time, they did um, illustrated books, cookery and gardening and craft and art books and things like that. So I was her assistant. And then I did a bit of export sales for a bit, um, which was, which was fun. But it being a small company, the I, I found myself doing other things like um, metadata and Amazon as well, and that was the that was the bit of the job I really liked. So um, I saw a job advertised Abrams and Chronicle as a data assistant, um, so I went for that um, and moved over to Abrams and Chronicle about three years ago. Um, and since then, yeah, I've just kind of taken more and more of the data on and now I manage all of our, our metadata for about 8,000 to 10,000 titles. It kind of fluctuates um, across various different platforms, um, sales software, and then obviously all the online retailers as well. So yeah, that's kind of been my, my progression so far. And then I've, I've gotten into doing some learning some coding on the side and things like that. Um, I was also chair of the SYP in, I think it was, gosh, I don't remember when it was. I was either 2015 or 2016. Um, so, yeah, so that was that kind of helped me along the way as well. Yeah, that's really impressive. Thank you very much for sharing your part with us. And what does a typical day as systems and data manager at Abrams and Chronicle Books look like? Um, so I mean, it's quite a it's quite a seasonal sort of job. So we'd be working on um, a season's load of titles at a time. Um, so like most publishers, we split up our year into um, autumn and spring, and we work to kind of sales windows around the book fairs. Usually, when they <laughs> when they happen in normal years, the normal sales windows. So. Um, it, it 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 sort of does depend on the time of the year. Mostly, what I'm what I'm kind of doing is I'm I'm creating Onyx records, um, which basically uh, Onyx is the industry standard for for data, for metadata, for storing, and for uh, disseminating data. So I'm creating records in Onyx to send them out to all of our um, online retailers. Um, I'm updating records, making them better. Um, you know, making updates and corrections if necessary. Um, yeah, just making sure our met- metadata is kind of accurate, that it's full, that we've got all of our fields that we need. Um, I spend quite a lot of time each day on Amazon because Amazon is obviously a huge customer and Amazon has a, a lot of um, different, you know, kind of distinct needs. Um, so I am working on um, creating 
records, titles, uploading titles onto Amazon, changing them, updating them, um, monitoring them, raising cases with Amazon where things aren't right. So there's a lot of that as well. Um, and then I also update our website and other sales software across the business. Um, and then I am often answering queries from colleagues and customers. And then there's the usual kind of meetings, emails, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite varied, but the basics are managing and optimizing our metadata and answering, answering any questions and queries that come in. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, metadata gets more and more relevant in the publishing industry each year and even more so now because of COVID. What is metadata essential is and why is it so important? So metadata is all of the data that surrounds a book. So um, metadata kind of means um, above or beyond something. Meta means above or beyond something. So um, the in this instance, the book is a piece of data and the metadata that surrounds it um, the data that surrounds it is the metadata. So it's things like, well, it can be as basic as the ISBN, the title, the author, the price, things like that. Um, and then it can go out to things like keywords, um, any kind of co co cover images or supplementary images, um, different prices and different markets, availability, that sort of thing. So it's it's kind of, it's all of the data that a bookseller or a customer would need to know about a book. Um and it's 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 more important than ever because of I think because of discoverability. So there are more books being published every year. It just keeps growing, and um, particularly for titles that need to find a kind of a niche audience, the 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 importance of getting your title in front of the right customer is really important. So metadata, having accurate metadata and having kind of full metadata helps with that. Um, and it so so it so massively drives sales. Um, and having good availability metadata also helps with kind of with booksellers as well. So they know that your products are available. They know, you know, you know that the price is correct. They can basically trust your messages on your products. Um, and I think particularly with COVID, because essentially physical bookshops have di had disappeared overnight um, a couple of months ago. So publishers had to react really quickly and push everything online and, and create digital products really quickly and get them out to the right platforms. So metadata was, you know, really important in that, making sure that, for example, with educational publishers or children's publishers, that parents and teachers could find the right information um, and your know, students could find the right information to kind of do their courses at home. Um, but also, you know, recouping some of those lost sales that that would have come from physical bookshops. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was a real test the COVID situation, I think. And I think publishers came out of it pretty well, actually. I think they they switched to digital pretty pretty well and pretty quickly. So that was that was re quite reassuring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what is your favorite project you have worked on during your career? Um, it was probably creating our Onyx feed and our Onyx database. So, I mean, it was in process when I joined the company, but I've sort of helped to create it and writing Onyx feeds and creating Onyx feeds is really fun. Uh, it's it's kind of like coding. I mean, it, it's essentially a form of coding. So it's written in a, in a language called XML, which is a markup language, kind of uh, similar to uh, HTML, which you write websites in. Um, some of your listeners might be familiar with. So XML, it's used all over publishing, but uh, Onyx is a particular form of XML, um, and you use it to create feeds that you then send out, information you then send out to booksellers and customers all over the world. So we had um, we brought we brought in an Onyx feed, and basically I had to take the data that was already existing and put it into that Onyx format and make sure that it got sent out. And that was that was really fun to kind of build a project from pretty much from the start to where it is now. So, um, and it's definitely made my life a lot easier as well. Um, so yeah, I think writing update, you know, creating Onyx feeds and learning how to do it from scratch as well, um, because there are a lot of software vendors that will sell you databases for onyx feeds but if you can also learn how to do them from scratch that's really really that's a really valuable skill i think um for the future so particularly if you work for a small small publishing company that doesn't have the budget maybe to pay a software vendor yeah that's really fascinating thank you and you're extremely passionate about coding could you give us a few examples of issues in publishing processes that coding can help solve yeah, I mean, I think, 
you know, it can re replace a lot of the duplication that we see in publishing at the moment where we've got, you know, information on multiple different places. Um, and one important thing that I've kind of learned from being kind of immersed in the, in the coding software world is that there needs to be one source of truth and, 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 you know, you don't want to repeat yourself unnecessarily. So I think removing a lot of the duplication and having one central place where information is and data is stored and kept would be massive for publishers. It would save a lot of time um, and reduce mistakes as well. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of things like you can, um, you can use coding to sort of, you can use it to automate processes like updating websites and producing catalogs. Um, and you can, you can write scripts uh, on your computer to automate kind of routine tasks that you do every day. So for example, checking things, updating things every morning, I'm sure we all do that, but um, a lot of that can be automated and reports can be generated and that can save you a lot of time and work. Um, and then, you know, there's things like, the fact that if we wanted to make a, a smaller website or a website with less functionality maybe or an app, a web application or another digital product, you know, we don't need to necessarily go outside of the company to do that. That's really important, I think, because I think publishers pay a lot and, and wait wait for a lot and long time for things that shouldn't take the time that they do and, and cost what they do because they're not that... Um, they're not that advanced a task, and I think that a lot of a lot of publishers, even with a small amount of coding knowledge, could learn how to do that um, and save themselves, save save the company time and money, basically, and become more self reliant, which is really important, I think. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. And which resources would you recommend to those who would like to learn how to code? Yeah, so I mean, I can, you know, I think we can obviously put this stuff in the in the show notes as well, which will be more helpful later on. But yeah. I think um, there are things like W three schools, which I started out on. There's websites like Code Academy. Um, there's Free Code Camp. There's so much free stuff out there. Um, and then there are apps, things like Solo Learn, Khan Academy, apps like Brilliant, which teach you kind of like fundamentals of computer science and they have a daily challenge feature where you can you can log in and basically solve a, a problem each day and they give you the concepts and then they let you kind of you know get to grips with them solving solving a challenge or answering a question so that's really fun um so yeah and there's and you know there's there's the usual courses on things like udemy udacity all the kind of the usual online education providers um and then there's a lot on youtube as well so i mean i think that there's there's so much online for free and if people have the time then they don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money um getting these resources but you know it, it does take time to learn um but i think that's something that particularly at the moment um a lot of people coming out of university could could really be doing to make themselves you know more likely make make it more likely to to get a job later on perfect thank you and which advice would you give to people who aspire to work in digital or tech roles in publishing? And what are the skills they need to develop? Yeah, I mean, I just, the advice I'd give would just be to learn about the tech and digital world, like not just in publishing. Um, so, you know, keep an eye on news in tech, keep an eye on kind of new programming languages that are coming out, new platforms, the, the kind of innovations that people uh, that big tech companies are doing because if you follow that stuff you can get ideas that you can you know maybe bring into publishing and understanding kind of the dynamics of this world and of, of the tech world and how it works and, and the problems and the challenges that they're trying to to deal with um i think you know in terms of skills tech tech and digital publishing is it's very um, based on kind of hard skills, unlike other areas of publishing which might be more people skills or you know um more soft skills so you know management and and publicity and things like that so i think that learning things like um how to build a website html css learning um kind of how to the fr front end develop front end web development frameworks that will help you build up like applications that would that would be really useful things like learning um photoshop illustrator learning a bit about basically the basics of design web design and branding is really useful um even things like video editing podcast editing and make uh, i would say make your own stuff 
uh, exactly like you're doing, Flavia, you know, just produce a product, get it out there, learn how to make a product and learn how to market it and promote it. And I think that those are all skills that kind of employers are going to be looking for um, in the next few months to years. That's great advice. Thank you very much. And we met last autumn, thanks to the Society of Young Publishers Mentoring Scheme, SOP Ahead. In your opinion, how having a mentor can help a junior professional develop their career? Well, I mean, I can only speak from my own experience when I was in my first like two or three years of publishing. I mean, having a mentor, I, I had a few people that you know, luckily took interest in my career and helped to kind of boost me and gave me their own platforms and were just really kind of giving of their time and energy. Um, And I think it gives you confidence for a start that somebody, you know, is invested in what you're doing and thinks that, you know, you have something that they want to help develop. But I think it also, you know, it's practical advice, things like applying for jobs, things like career direction, um, Resources that you might not be aware of, so for example, educational or professional development resources and contacts as well, because publishing is such a massively people business that I think, you know, having a mentor is really important in introducing you to people and building up your network as well. So I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And which advice would you give to young publishers who are looking for a mentor through the SYP, similar initiatives or even on their own? The, I think the, the 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 most obvious thing to do would be to try and get involved in one of the schemes that's already running. So the SYP is a really good example of that. Um, and I think that, you know, if you want to go into one of the more, it's it's really tough to get an editorial or a literary agent mentor for obvious reasons. Everyone wants to do, everyone wants to get into those areas. So if you want to work in tech or digital publishing, it might be a bit easier to find somebody. Um, if you can't do one of the formal schemes, you know, it's absolutely fine to approach people you know and say can we meet for coffee sometime I'm really interested in what you're doing on x you know I want to do something similar myself or hey I've created this product would you mind giving me your feedback on it or something like that I think that's absolutely fine I mean people can just say no Um, but in my experience publishing people are you know happy to give of give of their time and, and energy and I think that you know it's 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 a very people focused industry and I think people you know are are happy to be approached at least even if they can't give you the time at that point but I think you know just just respecting somebody's time but also saying you know I'm looking for advice here and having specific questions helps as well or a specific idea of where you want to go but you just need some advice or help or you need an introduction is easier for somebody to say yes to that than you know if you just say oh I don't know what to do um, because that's quite hard to hard to develop with somebody. Um, so yeah, I, I you know approach people. You can approach people on their own. You, um, do your research first and find out what it is they do. Um, and you know, is it is it something that's relevant to you as well? Because you know, if, if and and tailor your approaches to them as well to show that you've done that research because that's kind of more likely to give you a positive response. Um, but yeah, just keep trying. I mean, I think that it's definitely worth definitely worth asking. That's great advice. Thank you very much. And you were named a bookseller rising star in 2015 and won the London Book Fair Trailblazer Awards in 2018. How do you think this has helped your career and what positive impact do these prizes have on the overall industry? So I've been asked this before. It's really hard to tell um, because I think a lot of these people that are winning these prizes are probably, you know, very ambitious and very hardworking, um, myself excluded, obviously, <laughs> that probably on their way to success or a high profile anyway. But I think that, well, for me personally, they've been a massive confidence boost. So, you know, winning something, again, it's it just boosts your confidence. It makes you feel like other people recognize you. And that's really nice. Um, and you know, it's always nice to be recognized, um, for, for, for work that you've done. Um, I think it has helped in some sense. It does help with, you know, applying for jobs and things like that. That's, that's obviously clear, you know, being involved with these things is, is a good thing to have on your CV. So I I would encourage people to apply for them. Um, because again, the, the worst thing that can happen is that, you know, 
you, you don't get it or whatever. But even, you know, even being like considered long listed, short listed, it's all something that you can kind of put on your CV that will, will kind of make you stand out. And I think that that's going to be really important in the future, you know, even more important as competition gets more, more and more fierce for, for jobs. But, um, yeah, I think they have definitely, they've definitely helped me in terms of confidence, in terms of visibility in the industry, um, and in terms of, you know, getting me connected to people that I wouldn't otherwise have been connected to. Um, and I think, you know, they've helped me get, get interviews for jobs, even if not necessarily the jobs themselves. So they're very worthwhile and I'm, I'm really, really grateful, um, for them and for the people that have, you know, put me forward for them and picked me for them. I'm really, you know, it means so much. So, um, you know, really grateful to have been, to have been considered for them. And I think that, you know, to young publishers, I'd say, go for it. You'd see, you know, try, try and see what, what you can get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which book are you reading at the moment? Uh, what has been your favorite of the year so far? So, uh, so I'm reading a book. Um, I don't know if you know the Chernobyl TV series that was out last year um, about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Did you did you see that one? I know it, but I didn't watch it. Yeah, yeah. So I so I really liked it. So I'm reading at the moment a book about that called Chernobyl, which is history of a tragedy, which is not very cheerful reading, but it's I it's really I really like it. It's really interesting. Yeah, I just finished a, a book called um, Eve Was Framed which is all about, it's a vintage book, um, uh, the, the vintage imprint, which is all about women in, in the law and women in prison and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, it's a feminist book, but it's all about how women are treated in the law. So that was really good as well. So yeah, um, interesting, interesting books. I haven't read much fiction lately. I want to get back into, into reading fiction. Um, so I'm thinking about reading Conversations with Friends, which is the obviously the, the first Sally Rooney book before normal people um, mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, thanks. These are really interesting book recommendations. So thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, it was a real pleasure. No problem, Javier. It was lovely to be here. Thank you. And thanks for the, you know, all the work that you do on the podcast, because I know it's a lot of hard work and it's an amazing resource for so many people. Thank you. That's really kind of you. Thank you. That is all for this episode of Publishing Insight. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it and found it useful. If so, please subscribe and recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to learn more about working in digital roles in publishing, you can listen to episode 7 of season 1 and episode 1 of season 2. You can find them linked in the description box along with my email address, website and social media handles. Hope you're having a nice day and I'll see you in the next episode.